Okay, well, um, hello everyone. My name's Josh and uh, I'm a student at Seven Oaks School in Kent. Uh, and I'm hoping to go on to be an aeronautical engineer. And I think it's a really fascinating and exciting time to do so uh, because of this kind of huge challenge that we're currently tackling uh, to reduce aviation's carbon emissions to net zero and the real innovation and technological advancement that this goal is driving. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about hydrogen's role in this transition to net zero, both in the longer term as a propellant itself and in helping to solve the nearer term need for, green, uh, for, for a green solution to the sustainable and cost effective production of synthetic fuels. I'll actually focus on one key problem with the use of hydrogen and that is its production method. Fortunately, a new and fast fascinating technology called thermal plasma electrolysis is being developed by a company called Hyrock, which has the potential to produce hydrogen cleanly and affordably. I was lucky enough to be able to do uh, work experience with Hyrock over the summer uh, during uh, the fleetingly brief relaxation of lockdown uh, and I genuinely think it's a, a great new technology uh, which I really hope you find as interesting as I do. Um, but let's start with the context. Um, although aviation's contribution to total global warming may only be 3.5%, it's doubled since 2000 and importantly, it's a high profile contributor with many consumers, voters and campaigners critiquing the industry. Subsequently, the UK group Sustainable Aviation has set the goal of the aviation industry being net zero emissions by 2050. They lay out five key initiatives uh, to achieve this. Uh, more efficient aeroplanes, uh, the use of sustainable aviation fuels, uh, airspace modernization, uh, so essentially better air traffic control, uh, market-based measures and carbon capture. Uh, so of course this is a huge goal and in 20 minutes I could only scratch the surface of all the ongoing research and development towards achieving this across all five areas. Um, however, one thing that really stands out to me in terms of its potential to greatly reduce pollution uh, and to re revolutionise propulsion uh, is hydrogen. Um, so why hydrogen? Uh, well, we want hydrogen because it burns extremely cleanly only producing water. It also burns extremely well. So whilst it might not be the best in airships, uh, it's perfect for energy production. Uh, through direct combustion and fuel cells, it can replace conventional fuels like petrol and diesel in transportation. Within aviation specifically, uh, we've seen Airbus take a leading role in this hydrogen revolution. Uh, likewise, UK-based Zero Avia are using a zero emission powertrain uh, based on electric propulsion powered by a hydrogen fuel cell system. And this initially is focusing on 500 miles zero emission travel in a 10 to 20 uh, seat regional configuration. So what's the problem? Uh, why isn't all transport already hydrogen fueled? Well, there's currently a, uh, a problem with the production of hydrogen. Current production processes limit its potential by being uh, either too polluting or expensive. So we need a new way to make hydrogen to meet the upcoming demand in an environment environmentally friendly and cost effective way. And this is where thermal plasma torches come in or thermal plasma electrolysis comes in. So, um, and it, this is a process which allows hydrogen to be produced in this environmentally friendly and cost effective manner. So this is an overview of the uh, process. Uh, as you can see, firstly, methane is disassembled by a plasma torch at over 6000 degrees C, uh, producing gaseous hydrogen and crucially, uh, gaseous carbon. Uh, this prevents kind of sogging or clogging uh, of the uh, torch from solid carbon. Uh, these gases in the form of a jet of plasma are expelled from the torch at Mach 2 to 3 uh, where they enter the quenching chamber. Uh, here the gaseous carbon is quenched, uh, essentially cooled really quickly by uh, liquid metal uh, to produce carbon black uh, before the carbon and hydrogen can recombine uh, to make methane. Uh, in a third chamber, the filtration vessel, uh, the products are separated, uh, the, um, uh, the hydrogen taken off and uh, the carbon collected. Uh, and this process is highly efficient and it's very reliable. 
um, using about a fifth of the uh, electricity of electrolysis. Uh, for greater efficiency, higher outputs of hydrogen and smaller physical and a smaller physical footprint, um, the unit runs at 50 bar of pressure, um, producing gaseous carbon, unlike other processes such as pyrolysis, uh, does not leave carbon residue, uh, in other words, so, like I mentioned inside the torch, uh, which allows a continuous, um, not a batch um, process. Uh, and methane conversion is greater than 99%, so filtering the gas products is easy. So how does the plasma torch work? Well, plasma is the fourth state of matter, typically a highly ionized, uh, high energy ionized gas. Uh, it can be generated by heating a neutral gas or subjecting it to a strong electromagnetic field to the point where an ionized gaseous substance becomes increasingly electrically conductive. The latter is the principle used by most plasma torches. Generally speaking, there are two types of DC torches. Non-transferred, where both electrodes are inside the torch, and transferred where one electrode is outside the torch. This is typically a piece of conductive material uh, to be cut or something. Uh, and the type of torch used in thermal plasma electrolysis is the non-transferred uh, uh, type. So to be able to fully dissociate inputted methane into its constituent atoms, instead of just ionizing the gas, the plasma torch needs to have a seriously large electric field to rip apart the molecules. Uh, most torches are unable to efficiently generate and use the high currents required as they cause huge amounts of heating of the torch itself. Uh, in turn, this requires extensive cooling, further lessening uh, the torch's efficiency to about 50%. However, the recently developed High Rock torch uh, is engineered to have ultra high thermal efficiency over 95%, which allows it to efficiently operate at high enough currents to allow full dissociation of the methane. So how does it achieve this? Well, it's quite a complex process, at least for me to understand. Um, so if um, let's start with the assumption that the torch uh, operates at a very high current and voltage. Uh, that's kind of 300 volts and 200 amps. Uh, this means that the gas both dissociates and ionizes instead of only ionizing. Thus, whilst a conventional torch produces methane ions and electrons, the high rock torch is able to produce hydrogen ions, carbon ions and electrons. Now this means that more energy is given to the larger ions as there's five times more of them. Hence, as the ions in the form of plasma has a lot, have lots of energy, they move very quickly out of the torch. Uh, proportionally, less energy is given to the electrons. This energy cannot be reclaimed and ultimately causes the torch to heat up. So by reducing this amount of energy, we reduce wasted energy, improving the overall efficiency of the uh, process. Furthermore, uh, because more ions are produced, this also causes the volume of gas to increase, which results in plasma flowing faster out of the torch. Uh, and additionally, the torch is very cleverly engineered, so its geometry further increases the speed at which the plasma exits the torch. All in all, at at this point, the plasma jet is, like I said, between Mach 2 to 3. Now, this high speed exit means that excess energy is very quickly removed from the torch itself, uh, so it can be captured and reused outside the torch with minimal energy loss. And if it didn't do this, the amount of energy in the torch would cause it to melt. Uh, and excess energy is captured later in the process, where it's used to preheat uh, the methane entering the torch and for, the quench, uh, and for the quenching stage, uh, but more on that later. Um, and this increase, again, increases the overall efficiency of the process. And so we return to the beginning of the process. The higher overall efficiency means it's uh, economically and environmentally viable to put in the large amounts of energy required to generate such a large electric field. So now I'll talk quickly about the uh, carbon black byproduct. Uh, this is like yeah, a byproduct of the process. However, it is in itself in demand for use in things like rubbers, plastics, and printer toner. Uh, unfortunately, current production processes um, in the oil furnace are highly polluting, uh, as can be seen in this table with um, both large, large amounts of CO2 and other atmospheric pollutants. Uh, 
Uh, on the other hand, through the thermal uh, plasma electrolysis process, a clean, low-cost supply is available. Uh, interestingly, the team is just starting to work on how the um, amorphous carbon black can be combined with carbon nanotubes uh, to create a material with many properties of carbon nanowire, uh, but at a, lower, a much lower cost. Uh, the high strength to weight ratio, thermal conductivity uh, and EMI shielding properties could be used in aircraft construction uh, amongst many other areas. Overall, though, this carbon black byproduct, as I will explain, may be crucial to a nearer term solution to net zero aviation whilst we undertake the 20 year transition uh, to hydrogen powered aircraft. So we've seen how the aviation industry is under significant pressure to cut emissions. In the longer term, hydrogen could provide the power system to transform aviation. However, nearer term solutions such as synthetic jet fuel are also required. While synthetic fuels have been developed, no one has yet managed to produce them at scale and at a comparable cost to fossil fuels. And uh, interestingly, in kind of debriefing on my work experience with High Rock uh, and joking about my uh, <laughs> relative obsession with planes, um, the chief science officer um, and I kind of realize that this process uh, can be uh, of thermal plasma electrolysis can be uh, a solution uh, to produce affordable syngas uh, and synthetic fuel uh, jet fuel at scale uh, so how does this how do we do this well using thermal plasma electrolysis we can create cost effective syngas uh, which is a mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide which is then used to produce synthetic fuels the core process, uh, as you will see in the middle of the chart, uses thermal plasma electrolysis to split methane into hydrogen and carbon black. Um, the carbon black ex exits the unit at 1100 degrees C, and this property can be quickly used in the next step of the process, where half the carbon produced is combined with a waste carbon dioxide stream to create carbon monoxide using the waste heat in the carbon. This carbon monoxide can then be recombined with the hydrogen as syngas, uh, which can be then used for many other things, including producing synfuels using the Fischer trough process and catalytic hydro treatment uh, to produce uh, drop in jet fuel. Uh, and the high efficiency torches mean this uh, process can uh, produce cost effective syngas uh, and allow synfuel production at comparable pricing to fossil fuels. And crucially, however, Taking methane and other hydrocarbons from waste sources such as flares at refineries uh, or on the oil field uh, or from biomethane sources such as EPI's pyrolysis of organic waste uh, and by using renewable energy to power the torches is possible to produce um, negative carbon footprint synthetic fuel. Uh, to explain this, oops, um, to explain this, the resulting syn fuel is actually negative 50% and carbon footprint because every two carbons in the jet fuel for every two carbons in the jet fuel uh, there's an additional carbon sequestered a solid carbon black um, the original one from the original uh, the, the one from the original uh, thermal plasma electrolysis process uh, and this is a form of carbon that we can you know if we don't use it we can just bury it um, now i've looked at the role of thermal plasma electrolysis in producing hydrogen and synfuels. And now to tie off my presentation, I'd like to look at the future of this technology. Um, and essentially, I think the future is really bright. Um, last term after I returned to school, uh, High Rock applied for the ATI Boeing Accelerator and were accepted. Um, this is currently ongoing and they are conducting a lab proof of concept uh, using a two stage reactor. So first splitting the methane uh, and then combining the carbon with carbon uh, dioxide. Uh, which I hope to get involved with uh, over the summer once school finishes uh, and before I start um, university in September. Uh, excitingly, they're also working with uh, Scottish Enterprise for a full scale pilot in 2022 in FIF, uh, testing flare gas use uh, and the possible um, complications that the impurity of the flare gas uh, brings. Um, and that's powered, going to be powered by offshore wind energy. So thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it and I'd love to take any questions now. 
Josh, Josh thank you very much. much. That was, that was absolutely fascinating. fascinating. Um, and <laughs> very different uh, take uh, on some of the topics uh, uh, that we've been looking at as part of society. So I, I'd just like to start off uh, with asking some very uh, general questions. And my first one is around one of the statements get, that gets made quite a lot, which is that the only waste byproduct um, when burning hydrogen is water. Now, um, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, are there any reasons why you might think it might, that the byproducts of burning hydrogen might not be just water? Um, well, I suppose if there are impurities in uh, the fuel, or also in, um, uh, I know in car exhaust, when, we, uh, when you burn things uh, in an internal combustion engine, because the car exhaust is getting really hot, um, that's meaning that uh, nitrogen in the air uh, combines with oxygen to produce um, nitrous oxides, uh, which are obviously a uh, really bad, um, they, they, you know, they cause acid rain. Um, and that's just, I, I fear, an inherent um, risk of using a high, anything at a very high temperature. Um, no, you got that spot on. Well done. Uh, the the, the um, and it's interesting enough. It's not just um, uh, nitrous oxides that come out of high temperatures, but also it's a challenge um, uh, even when you're looking at, at um, fuel cells um, where they end up with um, you know nitrous poisoning of of the fuel cell uh, because of course we're burning in air, not burning in in oxygen. Um, so that was that was the question I always ask around around these hydrogen because uh, it, it isn't. Uh, a, a, a completely miracle fuel. Um, uh, whilst you were talking about this process, which uh, which you know which looks really uh, really interesting and really it looks like it's got a great potential, the one thing I was thinking about was um, the competitor technologies to producing hydrogen. Um, so, have you got any ideas about when I compare it with um, conventional electrolysis of water into hydrogen and oxygen, what the comparable advantages and disadvantages of this process are? Yeah, so um, the the main problem with electrolysis is obviously it's a green solution, um, uh, which is good. However, it's a really expensive one, and uh, you can it's only it can only be used in a batch process, um, I think. Um, whereas this thermal plasma electrolysis can be used on a continuous process and if hydrogen goes the way it looks like it is pretty much up, um, mm. there's going to need to be a much larger supply which is currently being filled by the steam methane reforming which is the polluting production method um, and, and that's the main uh, production method. I, I don't think if the electrolysis has uh, the potential to produce it on a large enough scale um, additionally, the, uh, the uh, thermal plasma electrolysis is um, really, I, I find it fascinating because it can be, um, it's small enough that it will fit into a container um, and you can produce loads of these containers and send them out to each individual oil fill or refinery uh, to uh, use the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, use the methane supply there. Um, and, and produce a continuous process and obviously methane is uh, pretty in excess at the moment especially with the kind of recent developments of fracking mm -hmm. um, so yeah I think it's um, got the potential to um, be a lot a much uh, larger scale production and, and, and in terms of uh, its utility for synthetic fuels, I think that was uh, uh, that's really interesting because, of course, then it's compatible with the current uh, aviation infrastructure. So uh, are there any um, drawbacks you see in terms of uh, that synthetic fuel development compared with the use of hydrogen? Well, the use of hydrogen is obviously um, the ideal um, step. Um, I mean, there's lots of stages in, in the, um, for, for instance, in the um, uh, Fischer trough process and the um, catalytic hydro treatment that take lots of energy um, to get to. Um, the, and the, yeah, the ideal world would be hydrogen, um, but it's just to the technology isn't there. Obviously, the, the safety um, hazard of, uh, key, uh, of having hydrogen in a plane. Uh, I mean that that was shown um, by the Hindenburg. I think um, there's 
big um, safety concerns that need to be addressed before uh, we can get to hydrogen. Um, so I think synthetic fuels are a great um, interim step, um, uh, which um, have the which are realistically able to uh, meet the net zero um, uh, goal. Great, thank you very much. Okay, um, and as ever, I'll open up the uh, questions to the floor. So again, if any of the attendees have got any questions they'd like to ask Josh, please do share them on uh, the uh, Q and A. Um, so yes, and so the, the final question I, I've got really around this technology, uh, Josh, is, is around, you, you talked about the, um, uh, the, the risks around the use of hydrogen. Um, of course, there are other chances of, of, of hydrogen, which of course, as, as a fuel, uh, because of course it is um, so much less dense than other fuels. So, um, you know, can, can you just give me your understanding of, of, of how you think people will be able to address the challenge of using hydrogen as a fuel? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, to be honest, I haven't thought about it too much um, because that is one of the main problems that are stopping us from using hydrogen today, isn't it? Um, how we store, sorry, my computer's beeping. <laughs> how we store and, um, how we store and, um, uh, transport hydrogen because it is less dense um, and one possible solution sorry <laughs> um, yeah. uh, one possible solution um, that was mentioned was uh, transporting methane instead um, because obviously that's um, got a much higher density uh, and you can transport that um, to uh, the, where, where the hydrogen is needed for instance um, uh, not in aviation, but uh, I know uh, they, uh, the company High Rock were looking at um, uh, developing uh, their units for um, uh, to place next to petrol stations. Uh, um, the, the only problem being the kind of electricity supply uh, for the process. Um, but by doing that, you can transport methane, which is a lot more transportable because um, it, it's just natural gas and lots of petrol stations have you know, are tapped in on the natural gas network um, and you can uh, you produce hydrogen at a petrol station, for instance, which can then be put, put directly into a vehicle uh, running on a fuel cell. That's fascinating. I hadn't realised it could be done at such uh, such local scale. Um, thank you. Um, I'll just pass you on to uh, one question for our audience. Uh, so someone asks, how does this sin fuel how does this sin fuel stack up against the alternatives, both in terms of technology and cost? Um, so the main alternatives that I've seen in the uh, aerospace sector are um, electric and kind of lithium ion battery powered aircraft. Um, I know Rolls Royce uh, have just finished uh, make, uh, the prototype of their electric aircraft, uh, which looks really exciting. Um, to be honest, I, I think developing both or, or as many uh, as broad a range of technologies uh, as we possibly can is uh, the best way forwards because I think the advantages and disadvantages of each technology um, for instance sin fuels um, uh, the, the, they're still releasing carbon dioxide when they're burnt um, on the other hand um, uh, electric aircraft uh, lithium-ion batteries are really damaging to the environment to produce um, so I think developing as many different technologies in conjunction with one another um, and uh, kind of ha harnessing the benefits from both um, and combining them is the best way uh, forwards. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. That's a really good answer. Great. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you uh, very much for participating and, and presenting.